Just curious, uh, who here is vegan? Oh, okay, right on. And who here is vegetarian? Yay. And who here loves animals? <laughs> Unanimous. Um, well, I do as well. And it, as a matter of fact, everything that I know today has been taught to me by an animal. Zena was a goat that I rescued from an abusive petting zoo. And I had rescued her with a tiny nursing baby and brought them in and healed their bodies and helped them learn to trust. And they were doing fine just scampering around my backyard. This was at the very beginning when I first started the Gentle Barn 17 years ago. And one day, I came out in the morning to find four newborn babies on the ground. Wow. And it was so unexpected that I thought my neighbors were playing a joke on me. So I looked over both fences to find the neighbors laughing at me, and there were no neighbors. And then I was like, where did these babies come from? And I realized that Zena had given birth. Now, I had no idea that she was even pregnant. And I rescued her with a tiny nursing baby, so the thought never crossed my mind that they might have impregnated her already. So on closer inspection, I realized that two of the babies were stillborn. It's very, most goats have one babies, and they can have twins like we do, but it's abnormal for them to have three, and definitely not normal for them to have four. So two of the babies were stillborn. And then when I looked at the two other babies, they seemed like they were really struggling. There was something not right with them. And I had to get them to the hospital. So I was there by myself. There was no one else around. Zena outweighed me by about 100 pounds. But I was like, I can do this. I was very stubborn and very determined at the time, still am. And I thought, I can do this. So I went over to her and I tried picking her up. That didn't work. I tried putting food in the crate so that she would go in there. That didn't work. I tried pushing her and pulling her and trying to pick her up again. It did not work no matter what I did. And after about a half an hour, and the babies were laying there dying, so, you know, it was an urgent situation, I finally slumped down on the floor of the barn against the wall and started crying. And out of sheer exasperation, I started talking, I guess, to her, saying, Zena, your babies are dying. I have to get them to the hospital. If we don't, they will die. As soon as they're better, you will all come back here to live forever at the gentle barn, please. And she looked at me like, why didn't you say so? And she walked into the crate and sat down. That's when I learned that animals can understand pretty much everything. And at the gentle barn, when we're training volunteers and staff, our very first lesson is they understand everything, do not touch their bodies, and do not do anything with them until you tell them what's happening first. And it's really helped us be able to treat them medically or transport them. Really, that practice has really helped me. So Zeno was one of my master teachers. Another animal that I rescued early on from that original petting zoo was Sophie. Well, actually, it started with Billy. So Billy was this tiny little newborn goat, and he had um, pneumonia. So he couldn't breathe, and he had stuff coming out of his nose, and it was clear that he was very, very sick. And I found him at a petting zoo. So I asked the owner of the petting zoo if I could take Billy home, and she said, yeah, whatever, I don't care. And I said, well, where's her, his mom? Because he was so tiny, where's the mom? And she said, I don't know where the mom is, but she doesn't care about him. Now, this was 17 years ago when I didn't have a lot of experience with goats. So she was the expert, in my opinion. I doubted myself. It didn't sound right to me that a mom goat wouldn't care about her baby goat. But okay, you know, if she says so. So I picked him up and started walking out. And there was a crash behind me. There was screaming behind me. And I didn't have to look behind me to know that that was the mom. And I looked back, and of course, the mom was going ballistic trying to get to her baby. So I went to the lady, and I said, how can you say that that mom doesn't care about her baby? And she said, yeah, but in about, you know, by the end of the day, she'll stop crying. And I said, well, yeah, if somebody kidnapped my baby, by the end of the day, there'd be no more tears left. But how can you say she doesn't care? I'm taking her, too. So I took Sophie and Billy to the, petting zoo, uh, to, to the gentle barn, and I nursed Billy back to health, and... Do you know that Billy nursed for three years? And she, Sophie was such a doting mom. She would groom him, and she would eat by him, and she would lay by him. They were inseparable their whole lives. They both lived well into their teens, and they were inseparable their whole lives. And she nursed him till three, and then one day he came to nurse, and she said, nope, you're done now. And that was the end of that. That was the extent of the conversation. 
But she really showed me how much animals love their babies just like we do. They want to raise their babies and nurture their babies and protect their babies just like we do. And watching her mother him was such a privilege and an honor. And when she was elderly, they switched just like humans. He started taking care of her and he started grooming her. And he started watching over her. And it was just the sweetest thing. No different than any of us in a loving mom. And Yeah, absolutely. So she really taught me how much animals want to be moms and family just like us. So 17 years ago, I had just started The Gentle Barn. And there was a World Veg Fest, just like here, that had just started in Los Angeles. And I was approached by one of the directors asking if they could have the volunteer meetings at the Gentle Barn. And I said, sure. So they were having their meeting, and one of the men came up to me just to thank me and ask me my story. And he asked me if I was vegan. And I said, no, I'm American. So he laughed. <laughs> and he said, no, I mean, do you eat animals? And I very proudly told him that I stopped eating animals when I was 11. And he said, yeah, but do you drink milk or dairy or eggs? And I said, oh, yeah, but that doesn't hurt anybody. And he proceeded to tell me that actually the dairy industry is the veal industry. And I said, what are you talking about? What does that even mean? And he said, well, dairy is cow's milk. And cow's milk is breast milk, just like any other mammal. Every mammal on this planet, including humans or dogs or cats or giraffes or elephants, we all give birth to live babies and we all have breast milk for those babies. And cows are no different. So the only way to get cow's breast milk from a cow is to impregnate that cow. And then when the baby's born, they don't want the baby, they just want the breast milk. So the baby's taken away and killed for veal and the breast milk is stolen for humans to drink. My head was spinning. I couldn't even believe what he was saying. And so I said, well, you asked me if I was vegan. I am now. And that was the day that I learned that cows can't even be mothers. And it was pretty devastating. So um, I founded The Gentle Barn 17 years ago. And uh, a few years later, Jay came in, who's uh, sitting right here. Jay came in as a volunteer and never left. And so now Jay and I run the Gentle Barn together. And it's our dream to have Gentle Barns in every state in America so that everybody can hug a cow and give a pig a tummy rub and cuddle a turkey and look in the eyes of these animals and know for certain that we're all the same. Um, a few years ago, we did um, a very big rescue from a cruelty case. We discovered a really bad cruelty case. The animals were suffering terribly. And we went in, Jay went in and befriended the man and started pulling animals out and built a case and eventually was able to uh, send the guy to jail and, and shut him down and take the animals to freedom and safety. But early on when we were still building the case, there was a few cows that we brought into the gentle barn that were dying at this place. And so we brought them in and um, one of them's name, we named her Karma. And Karma couldn't, wouldn't stop crying. I mean, we brought her in, she passed the vet check, she had food, she had water, she had shelter. Everything seemed fine, and yet she would not stop crying and pacing and crying and pacing. So at first we thought, well, maybe she doesn't understand our intentions. Maybe she's scared of what we're going to do to her. And then several hours passed and we thought, well, maybe she misses the animals that she was with at the backyard butcher because we haven't gotten them yet. Jay and I sleep with our windows open at night, no matter what season, so that we can hear what the animals are doing and if they call to us, we can hear them. On this particular night, no one got any sleep because karma just kept crying and I couldn't figure out why. Well, in the wee hours of the morning, I finally woke up and said, that's it, I gotta figure this out. And I went down to the barnyard, and I was like, Karma, what is wrong? And I scanned her body in the hopes to find some wound or something that we had missed before. And then I finally found it. She was dripping milk. What does that mean? She had a baby. So I called Jay and I was like, Jay, she's crying because she had a baby. And I guess the guy hid her from us. And so Jay said, I got this. And he hung up the phone and he called the backyard butcher and he said, dude, not cool, where's the baby? And the guy said, I am so sorry, I had to hide the baby from you because I already sold the baby um, for Christmas dinner. 
I'm about to drive the baby to where he's supposed to be. The only reason I'm still here is because the truck broke down. As soon as Jay heard that, he hung up the phone, hooked up the truck and trailer, and drove as fast as he could to that guy's house. When he got there, thankfully they were still there. So Jay got out of the truck and went over to the guy and said, okay, this is how this is going to work. I'm going to fix your truck. You're going to give me the baby. And the guy said, what are you even talking about? We've been here for three hours. Like, what do you know that we don't know? And Jay said, it doesn't matter. I'm going to fix your truck. You're going to give me the baby. So the guy, not believing that Jay could do it, shook Jay's hand. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but there's a thing that happens where a, a truck is parked on a, on a hill that it could rest back in and get stuck in its gears. So all Jay had to do was pull the truck three feet up the hill, unstick the gears, and the truck was fine. And the guy, furious, honored the handshake and gave over the baby. So Jay drove the baby home. And the minute Karma heard her little baby answer from inside the trailer, the baby started screaming, the mom started screaming, they started screaming to each other, the mom's trying to climb over the fence, trying to get to the baby, and we brought the baby out. And the, the baby was actually, so we know the story from the mom's perspective, right? How crazy she was going at the loss of her baby. But can you imagine what it was like for that baby? One minute he feels safe, he's eating, he's nursing, he's loved, and the next minute he's tied up in the back of a pickup truck with no mom, no food, no nothing. So he never thought he would see her again. So the minute he came out of the trailer and saw her, he actually collapsed from relief and, and stress and fear. And she came over and she licked his body and she made little encouraging sounds to him and he finally found the strength to stand up and she licked his whole body and loved him all over and then he went and nursed. And the mom said, oh. and she hasn't made a sound since. So that was supposed to be the end of the story and a happily ever after, right? That's, you know, they would live together forever for the rest of their lives at the gentle barn. Well, there's more. So eight months later, mom and baby are doing great. Eight months later, one of our workers came to us at the end of a long day and said, I'm worried about karma. And I said, why? And he said, well, her udders are swollen. And I said, oh, do you think she has an infection? And he said, no, I think she's going to have a baby. And I said, well, don't be ridiculous. We rescued her with a tiny nursing baby. Surely they wouldn't have impregnated her again. And he said, just check on her. So Jay and I have a ritual every single night where we go down before bed and we check on all the animals. And we give kisses and cookies to the cows and we give carrots and kisses to the horses. We tuck the pigs in with blankets and we make sure the chickens and the goats are fine. And we check on everybody before bed. So on this particular night, it was very late. Jay wasn't feeling all that well, so he had gone to bed already. And I went down to check on everybody. And when I came up to the cow area, Karma was right at the fence, looking right at me. And I came up to her and I said, Aldo's worried about you. What do you think, girl? And she turned around and there was a foot sticking out of her. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. So I drove up to the house and I woke Jay and the kids up and I said, wake up, we're having a baby. <laughs> and I woke the, we woke up the kids and we went down to the barnyard. And here's where it gets good. And I swear this is a true story. When we had 20 cows at the time. We went down to the barnyard Every single one of those 20 cows was in a perfect circle around karma. And nobody got bored and walked off. Nobody shoved or pushed to be closer. Everybody was in a perfect, quiet, gentle circle. So me and Jay and the kids took our place in the circle. And we all stayed there patiently and we watched her. And we watched her labor and contract and push. And we watched her son be born. And then we watched her lick him and clean him off and make encouraging sounds to him so that he could learn how to stand and then figure out how to walk and then figure out how to nurse. And we, nobody moved. We watched this. It took about two hours. And we all stayed there quietly watching the whole thing. And then once he had drunk his fill, the baby went over to the side and laid down to sleep off his birth, at which point... Every single solitary cow broke the circle simultaneously and formed a single file line in front of the baby. And, the fr and nobody said, hey, I was here first. Nobody fought. Nobody struggled. The matriarchs and elders went in the front, and the younger, more submissive cows went in the back. And everybody knew where their place was. And the first in line was the matriarch, 
she went over to the baby and she licked him and she smelled him and she welcomed him and she introduced herself to him and then she moved off. And then the second in line welcomed the baby and the third and the fourth until every single cow in that family welcomed the baby. And then once all the cows were done, me and Jay and the kids, we took our turn welcoming the baby. And then we all lay in the moonlight watching him sleep with big smiles on our faces. It was amazing. We named him Surprise. Do you know that so she, Karma is an itty bitty cow, tiny. She's really, really little. Surprise is 3,000 pounds. It's like a mountain. And do you know that he nursed till he was five? And he had to lay down and roll over to do it. It was a little embarrassing. And I would go up to her and I would say, Karma, you know you can cut him off now. He's in college. And she would look at me with her sweet, wise, gentle face, and she would say, you know, he's my last baby, and I'm going to enjoy him while I can. We had veterinarians at the time who are no longer our vets, um, but we had veterinarians at the time who were kind of very active in the dairy and meat industry, so they did things a certain way. And they came out, and they would see that display of the, of the baby laying, 3,000 pounds, laying upside down underneath her to try and nurse. And they would like have a fit and they would say, this is not okay, you need to wean him, you need to separate them. And I would say, you know what, I have three kids and I nursed them all. And nobody told me when to stop. They trusted me and my body and our relationship to know when it was time to stop. And I'm not going to tell her. So she nursed him for five years. But what I realized was, you know, in the real world, there are no families, right? In the real world, these babies are taken away the minute they're born as the moms scream on the top of their lungs for their babies. There are no mated pairs. There are no brothers and sisters, no uncles and aunts, no cousins. And we got to be part of this incredible family at the gentle barn and watch Surprise grow up among 20 cows that all took turns playing with him. They all took turns babysitting him while my mom was resting. They all took turns scolding him when he was being a little naughty. They all, like if there was a noise on the street or a stray dog, they all surrounded him. Every single member of that family took part in his upbringing and raised him to be a wonderful, thriving, ethical, valuable member of that family and community. And in watching him grow up and in watching everyone love him and raise him and teach him, it occurred to me that I, you know, now after all these years of running the gentle barn, really the highest value to a cow is family. And they love each other so, so much. And so we feel really, really blessed to be part of that. And we also simultaneously feel very sad that there are no families for animals in the rest of the world. That at the gentle barn, we've done a great job of giving the animals sanctuary and healing their bodies and restoring their hearts and watching the life come back into their eyes and giving them a place to live for the rest of their lives where they can fall in love and they can form families um, and they can be together. Um, and then, when they're ready, they can be ambassadors and pay it forward by loving and giving hope and inspiration to at-risk inner city and special needs kids that come and visit them. So at the gentle barn, these animals have great big purpose. But in the rest of the world, the same animals that came in hoping for a great big purpose are seen as things we eat and things we wear and things we can throw away when we don't want them. I used to think that there was either good people or bad people. I used to think that there were either people who were generous or people that were greedy. And I used to think that there was one or the other. And I have to say that the longer that I live and the more people that I meet and the more that I kind of evolve and grow personally, I don't believe that anymore. I don't think that it's one or the other. I think that those attributes live in all of us. I think all of us have the potential to be good or bad, greedy or generous, spiteful, hateful, loving, compassionate. I think those qualities can reside in all of us. And I think what it really comes down to is it comes down to a choice. And that choice is, where are we going to plant our feet? And every single one of us has to make that choice for ourselves. Where are we going to plant our feet? Are we going to plant our feet in goodness or badness? Are we planting our feet in generosity or greed? 
Are we planting our feet to make money and get instant gratification? Or are we planting our feet on the side of things that will be sustainable and fair to all? And that choice we need to make wherever we go, whatever we buy, and every single thing that we eat. We are always making that choice, conscious or otherwise. And that choice of where we plant our feet defines us as individuals, but it also defines us as a species. And I've answered that question for myself a long time ago. I know where I plant my feet. I plant my feet in goodness, in reverence for all life, in kindness, in compassion, in thoughtfulness. And that's where my feet are right now, and that's where they'll stay till the end of my days. And sometimes it's hard, and sometimes it's easy, and sometimes it's not convenient, and sometimes it's expensive. But it doesn't matter, because that is where I'm planting my feet. I think this demise or struggle that Mother Earth is suffering right now, I think that the pain and the agony that animals go through, I think the obesity rate and cancer rate and heart disease rate, and all the diseases that we're dealing with and the illnesses that Mother Earth is dealing with and the way that animals are treated, I think it is tied down to one single issue and that's where are we as consumers going to plant our feet and where are we going to plant our dollars? And I don't think that the answer to protecting the environment and healing our bodies and allowing the animals the freedom and the respect that they deserve, I don't think the answer to those things is going to happen with politics. I don't think that government is going to come in and exude change. I don't think that it's going to take a war to change it. I don't think that they, whoever they are, are going to come in and make a difference. I think that this change and this evolution is, is ours. I think it happens when every single solitary one of us decide once and for all where we are planting our feet with everything that we buy and everywhere we go and everything that we eat. And we make that decision, we make that commitment, and we all stand up on the side of right and peacefulness and gentleness and kindness. And that is when things will change. And indeed they are. They are changing. I mean, look at how many people attended this conference and how much delicious plant-based food was eaten and all the smiles and the kindness that was here today. Indeed, we are changing it. Um, do any of you feel sad sometimes? Do any of you feel hopeless and defeated sometimes? Do any of you plug into the suffering of the animals and think, oh my God, this is just such a horrible place. Raise your hand if you go through that. So I have some good news and I have some bad news for you. I'll start with the bad news. I got bad news and I got good news. The bad news is, as the ones who are awake, we are now connected to everything. We are connected to the earth. And when the earth is suffering, we suffer too. We are connected to the trees, and when they're being chopped down for the meat industry, we suffer too. We are connected to the rivers, the streams, and the oceans, and when they are being depleted and overfished, we suffer too. And we are connected now to every being on this planet, and when they are encaged, and when they are suffered, and they are treated as object and enslaved, we suffer too. So that is now something that we just know, being awake, means that we suffer with every suffering being on the planet. But here's the good news. As the awake ones, we can change it. We can implement what we know. We can shine our light. We can use our voice. And we can implement the change that this planet needs. Because we are the awake ones. I like to call us the light workers. We are the light workers. Yes? We are the light workers. And we have awakened so that we can come and lead the way. So what do we do now that we know? What do we do now that we're awake and we're suffering, suffering along with the planet and along with every living species? What do we do now that we know the truth and we've implemented change in our own lives, but we still see suffering around us? How do we stay hopeful? How do we stay strong? Well, I'll tell you a few secrets that we've implemented in our lives, and maybe it's something that will make sense to you. Um, so first of all, I think the most 
powerful thing that we do that seems to help us is we vision every single day. Before I leave my bedroom in the morning, no matter how busy I am, no matter what pressing meetings I have, it, no matter how late I woke up and now I gotta rush downstairs, before I leave my bedroom, I set my alarm for five minutes. And I sit there in the stillness and I take three nice deep breaths and then I vision the world that I wanna create. I imagine big herds of horses running free with their manes flowing in the wind and their tails up high and I can feel the ground shake underneath me as their thundering hooves pass me. And I envision all the people just waving to them and blessing them on their way. And I envision big, gorgeous, rich forests with trees so high that they touch the sky because people are not chopping them down. And I envision rich, fertile earth underneath my toes in which gardens grow, big gardens that feed the world. And I envision people holding hands and cradling chickens and hugging cows and being kind. And I envision clean rivers and thriving oceans in which marine life live and thrive. I envision the population being awake. I envision children being connected to who they are and what they know and shining their light. And I envision a gentle world. And I'll tell you why this is so important. As light workers, we need to focus on the problem. We need to illuminate the problem. We need to help guide our loved ones to the solution. But we need to spend a little time every single day feeling, tasting, touching, and smelling the, the answer, the gentle world. Because if we can't vision it, if we can't see it, taste it, touch it, smell it, then who else is gonna? We have to. We have to know with every fiber of, my, of our being that we will have a gentle world. We have to know with our hearts and souls that it is possible. We have to hold on to it. We have to hold on to it. And then we spend the rest of our days working, loving, spreading the truth, illuminating the problems, guiding other people. But we have to spend at least five minutes every day knowing that that world is possible and living in it so that we can operate from that the rest of the day. And I also do that as I fall asleep. I picture that world. I yearn for it. I ache for it. And I feel it. Because I know it's coming. The other thing that's really, really helpful is at the Gentle Barn, we try to spread the message gently. It's really super easy when you see the problem so glaringly. It's so easy to just want to shake people. You just want to slap them and shake them and wake them up. But that will land me in jail very quickly. <laughs> I think that people have a desire to be in peace and harmony. And I think when you shock them too much, hit them over the head too much, make them feel defensive, they're gonna just push you away. But if you can deliver the message gently and kindly and with love and compassion, knowing that, hey, I didn't know till I knew. If you can do that, then people might hear more, embrace more. The other thing that helps me stay peaceful and hopeful is I definitely share the truth. I share what animals go through. I share how intelligent and loving and wonderful animals are. But I don't get attached to the outcome of who I'm giving the information to. Because that's not my job. My job, you know, yeah, it'd be great. I, whoever I talked to, it'd be a magic spell and they'd wake up instantly. But that's not realistic. Some people wake up immediately. Some people need to take, you know, it's slower. Some people kind of push off the message until maybe they're facing an illness or something really drastic happens to them. Um, and some people are not going to wake up in this lifetime, and that needs to be okay. We need to be responsible for what we're doing. We need to share the message gently, and then we need to not be attached to the outcome of what other people choose. We need to bless them on their journey. And that takes a lot of the burden off, because when you're attached to the outcome and you're like, oh my God, they're still eating meat. Oh my God, they didn't listen to a word I'm saying. All that anger, all that frustration. Dr. Martin Luther King said, you can't rid darkness with darkness. 
Only light rids the darkness. So when we're getting all angry and bent out of shape and, oh my God, they're still doing it. Why won't they wake up? And why is there so much cruelty? And why are people so horrible? That's not putting light in the world. That's putting darkness in the world. So we as light workers need to be the carrier of the light. We need to hold the light in our hearts no matter who we're talking to, no matter who we're thinking of. We need to hold that light and that compassion and that love to whoever is in front of us and share the information gently and then bless them lovingly on their way and, and detach. And that helps stay peaceful. The other thing that I wanted to share with you is who has ever heard of the 100th monkey theory? Oh, good. Okay. So the 100th monkey theory is something really powerful, and it gives me a lot of hope. So I love it. Um, basically, here's how the story goes. There was a small island of monkeys, and there was a fruit that fell on the ground, and it would get dirty. It would get full of sand, and then the monkeys couldn't eat it. But their younger monkeys learned that if you take the fruit and put it in the stream and wash it off, then you can eat the fruit. So these younger monkeys showed the older monkeys how to eat this fruit until the entire island, which was 10% of, of the world's population of monkeys, was doing this practice of washing off the fruit. When the entire island was doing it, simultaneously, every single monkey on the planet implemented that practice. So scientists saw that and said, huh, that's really interesting. I wonder if we're all connected. I wonder if we're all one. I wonder if there's a certain saturation of a consciousness. And once we have a certain saturation of that consciousness, I wonder if it simultaneously belongs to everyone. And so they wanted to do an experiment. And so they painted a picture with 200 faces hidden in it. And they took the painting all over America. But everybody tried really hard, but the most faces they could see in that painting was like nine. So then they went across the world to Europe, and they spent many months traveling around Europe showing everyone the 200 faces. And once they had shown 10% of the world's population those 200 faces, they then went back to America and spent several months touring again. And do you know that every single person in America could see the 200 faces? So they came up with a 100th monkey theory that suggests that if 10% of the population has a certain consciousness, then simultaneously it belongs to everybody. And the reason that gives me so much hope is because not everyone has to recycle, not everyone has to eat a plant-based diet, not everyone has to love animals, but if we can get 10% of the population to have that consciousness, to care about Mother Earth, to care about the animals, to care about their bodies, then simultaneously we will have that consciousness. And so we're at 5% right now. We just need to reach 10. That gives me a lot of hope. The other thing that really, really helps if anybody is suffering compassion fatigue or just feeling angry at the way the world is, is hugging a cow. Show of hands, who has ever hugged a cow before? <laughs> All right, not enough people. So I highly invite you guys to come to the Gentle Barn in Los Angeles, or Tennessee for that matter, and hug a cow and cuddle a turkey and give a pig a tummy rub and meet these animals face to face and kiss them and hold them and love them. Um, just being in their energy is amazing. I'm going to leave you with this poem because by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. She wrote this in... She wrote this, she lived in 1850 to 1919, so that was a long time ago, and she wrote my words. I am the voice of the voiceless. Through me the dumb shall speak, till the deaf, what, you there? <laughs> Let me start over. I am the voice of the voiceless. Through me the dumb shall speak, till the deaf world's ear be made to hear the wrongs of the world this week. And I am my brother's keeper, and I will fight his fight, and speak the word for beast and bird till the world shall set things right. Who's with me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Um, we, Jay and I have to catch a flight, so um, normally I would hang out and like talk to any of you, but um, we have to run, so I didn't want you to think that we're being rude. We, you have five minutes. We have five minutes? Yeah. We have five minutes? If anybody has any questions or wants to come chat, we have five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, um, we have a lot of videos on our YouTube channel. If you guys go to gentlebarn.org and press on the YouTube icon on the top, um, we have a lot of videos, actually, of the rescues that we've done. Yeah. Can you be a speaker also at the library? Sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you. Sure, yeah, thank you. Like reputable uh, sanctuaries and other ones are, are less uh, the case. Some may be for profit, may even be abusive to the animals. How, how do you how do we discriminate uh, among the sanctuaries that we have? Um, I guess by personal experience, you know. The question is, how do we discern between reputable sanctuaries and sanctuaries that might have ulterior motives? Is that what you're asking? Um, you would have to experience it for yourself. You know, go there. How does your heart feel when you're there? How do the animals look when you're there? How are the people there? You know, experience it for yourself. It would be my recommendation because I never go based on hearsay. The trouble is social media is really aggressive and unreliable. I was, I was just saying that social media is so unreliable uh, when it comes to how something is. I mean, I, I keep trying to use Yelp and different kinds of, of social media, you know, networking you know, groups to try and see how something is. And, and every time after I look at something and I go try it anyway, I'm still, I, and I have a good experience. I look back to the, what you know, was said on the internet and feel duped, I guess. You know, it seems like a, you know, an avenue for people who are so negative to go on and just bash you know, places, because there's some wonderful organizations out there that I know personally are wonderful, and they have horrible things said on social media, maybe by the dairy industry, maybe by, you know, people who disagree with the, the views that they hold, you know, um, it happens. So, you know, with your own personal experience, getting involved with the organization, calling, ask, talk, asking to talk to the founder, you know, and, and getting involved, uh, following their social media, like their Facebook accounts or Instagram, whatever you, you do, um, mm -hmm. following their social media and, and what they're saying. Um, and then you can also go on to different places um, like GuideStar and things like that. Not necessarily to see what aggressive, angry people are saying, but or not even what the positive people are saying, but to just go see that they're a registered nonprofit organization and that they, they've done the things that they needed to do to be worthy of receiving your support and then go and make your own you know, decisions and experiences. What's the name of that assignment? There's, there's many of them. If you were to search um, non-profit um, uh, regulating websites, you know, like GuideStar is one of them. GuideStar. Guide. GuideStar. Guide um, there's, a, there's a number, I think there's four or five different ones. and. Uh, some nonprofits aren't even registered with them, but they usually pick up their 990s, their tax forms, and they're able to look at them. Thank you any, any of you been to the gentle barn? Oh, you guys gotta come hug a cow. Went to the, went to the gentle barn Bay Area. Right? We're working on it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We don't have accommodations at the LA Gentle Barn. We do have um, a few guest rooms at the Gentle Barn in Tennessee. Um, but there are hotels very nearby. And yeah, we have a wonderful, exciting event coming up in November. It's our Thanksgiving Gentle, uh, gentle Thanksgiving event. It's on Thanksgiving Day, and people come from around the world to cuddle the turkeys and feed them pie. And then we have a gourmet, the most delicious gourmet meal you can even imagine. And then we have a Native American drum circle afterwards. It's really cool, yeah. Um, it's in Santa Clarita, which is 30 minutes north of Los Angeles, yeah. yeah. All right, guys, we have to go catch a flight. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.